Hello everyone, and welcome once again to my unnamed internet cartography show. I'm Daniel Huffman, and thanks for taking the time to join me here. Uh, a couple of notes before we begin. First off, I have changed the latency for the stream. That's something I noted in the chat, and that's just the gap between when you when I say or when I do something and when you see it. And the hope is that you know if I shorten that time, maybe things will be a little bit more interactive. Uh, the potential downside to that is that there's less buffering, so it could be more susceptible to loss in quality due to internet hiccups. So uh, just let me know in the chat if something's going wrong or if we're encountering a lot of problems with that, and I can always change it back to the way it was. I'm not actually sure what the latency is, so for a moment here, I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna shift my scene to my desktop, and I'm just gonna count three, Oh, it's about okay. So it's about three or four seconds. I got another computer next to me, and I can see what you guys all see. So, about three seconds, four seconds. That's not too bad. It was usually about seven or eight before. Uh, the second technical note here is that uh, now you can see me. I decided to add a little video feed in the corner and sort of struggled again with the question that a lot of streamers have about where do I put this so it doesn't get in the way of all the stuff I want to show. But we're going to try it out like this. And of course the very first time I chose to do this is also a day in which I got remarkably little sleep, and so I'm all sort of bleary-eyed and creaky-voiced, and uh, I hope you'll forgive me for that. So today, we're going to talk about labeling and typography, and it's something that I sort of, as a little quip on Twitter, referred to as the serene practice. And I just kind of made that up on the fly, but... You know, the more I think about it, the more I think that that kind of is true for me. There's something very deeply satisfying and oftentimes relaxing about doing map labeling and about thinking about typography and nerding out about it. And, you know, it sounds like that that's true for a number of the rest of you as well. You know, I uh, put on Twitter a comment that, you know, I called this the serene practice and I asked, you know, what's your serene practice? And... Tanya Buckingham said hers is generalization, but uh, a number of people also talked about label placement, like Hans von der Marl and Anton Thomas and, and Martha Bostwick. So it sounds like this is kind of a, a subject that a lot of people like to, to engage with. And I've often thought, you know, if you think about cooking, like there's this idea of uh, the brigade kitchen, you know, at large restaurants, they're sort of division of labor. Like somebody makes the sauces. Somebody handles fish. Someone handles pastries. And I always thought if mapping were divided up that way, uh, so that there were one person who made, you know, the choropleth colors and there were one person who did the terrain, etc., I think I'd most want to be the labeling person. There's just something really great about it. So, you know, today's Today's stream is a little bit different because we're just going to kind of talk about that broadly. Now, the other streams that I've done have been more focused on an individual map. You know, how do I make, make X, Y, or Z, and some of the practical tips that go along with that. And maybe we'll get into a little of that. Uh, but this is a little bit more, uh, a little bit more scattershot, I guess, and uh, a little bit more of my sort of improvised musings. But this is an informal setting, and we're all kind of gathered here together in our chat room and on the internet. And I think this is a good, a good place for that. And I hope you'll you'll add your comments in the chat and questions and such about your own thoughts because I kind of work best. You know, my preferred situation, oftentimes when I walk into a classroom or a workshop or whatever, is to kind of improvise just based on what other people are giving me, what other people are saying and thinking and asking about. And I can go on about typography off the top of my head for quite some time, as maybe you've seen if you've gone to NASIS, we have the, a couple of times we've had the Typophiles retreat sessions. So, yeah. Uh, one thing I do want to start off with, though, that I've been thinking about lately is uh, this comment by Martha. She's talking about, you know, label placement, beautiful curves of type on a physical map. And, you know, I've been thinking back to my own work, and I realize I really, really like making curved labels, and I seem to do it an awful lot, uh, potentially talking with some other people disproportionately frequently. You know, if I go to a couple of examples, some things that I've worked on, this is a, a physical map, uh, like the kind of that Martha was referring to, of this just the terrain of Michigan, and this is in my unfinished project bin. I do this thing where I work on a map and get it 99.5% done, and then just kind of walk away and forget to actually do the last four or five percent 
but if I just turn off the terrain here for a second, and uh, I'm just going to fill a layer in here with white so we can see the labels in the background. And I know there's a shortcut to do this, and I never remember what it is. Uh, we'll just zoom in here, and you kind of see there's a lot of swooping, curved labels everywhere. There's not a lot that's, that's straight. Uh, you know, a few features here and there, but a lot of the big stuff kind of is mimicking the shapes of the various moraines and hill ranges and what are generously called in Michigan mountains. Right? We have the we have the Porcupine Mountains, and we have the Huron Mountains, and a few things like that. Uh, not of great elevation, though. Uh, and another example, too, uh, this is a map that I made, another physical map, uh, for a trip that I took to Alaska one time, sailed up the Inside Passage. And again, if I turn off the background, there's a lot of swooping curves. And I've tried to think a little bit about why. Why do I like this? Why do I do this so much? Uh, and this is something that, you know, I, I encourage my students to think about a lot, too. When you like something, why do you like it? What is it we can learn from that, uh, that aesthetic preference? And I've started to think about the idea of intent as connected to this, that curved labels somehow feel more intentional to me. Uh, and one of the things that I've talked about in a few presentations in various places and on my blog and such is the idea that I think good design reflects a lot of human intent. There's clearly a person behind it. It doesn't look very defaulty. It doesn't look very easy. It doesn't look very, you know, the standard way things are. There is an evidence of intelligence. There's an evidence of somebody making the effort to create things that are not the standard presentation of things. That wasn't the easy way. And I think curves do that. And I think it's partly, you know, because of their technological history. So if you've looked at... Um, the second atlas of design, which I got a copy here on my, my bookshelf, there's a great map in there by Nat Case. I'm just going to find, there it is. And I'll show you on screen in a minute, not just through the camera, but you know, it's the, uh, the JB physical map of the world. And he's trying to replicate a, a, a sort of a map style by a publishing house uh, in the early 20th century, John Bartholomew and Sons. And he wrote this little essay accompanying it. It's one of the things I like most about the Atlas of Design, kind of talking about some of his design rationale. And one of the things he mentions is that much of the type in the Bartholomew's map was drawn along a curve. The difference in labor time between that type and type on a straight line was negligible when every letter was hand-drawn. And so that's something he tried to replicate in his map as well. He has almost everything on a curve somewhere. And so this comment that there's not a lot of difference when you're labeling things by hand. So that sort of implies that, you know, when you're not, there is a lot of effort difference. And so if we think about sort of the history of not just map production, but, you know, type in general, things that aren't hand lettered, a lot of the technological apparatus has been geared toward making straight lines. And it was ordinary written documents on a typewriter, for example, or, you know, linotype machines. And, you know, a lot of that apparatus has just been sort of moved over to assisting with maps and even digital technology. I'm, you know, I'm not an expert in the history thereof, but I can well imagine that if you had a graphics program in the 80s, you know, in the early days when things like Photoshop and Illustrator were being created, I'm going to guess that typing on a straight line was possibly your only option in some of the early versions, or at least, you know, options to type not in a straight line were rather more, uh, rather more challenging to accomplish. It's just easier to put a language which is designed for straight lines on straight lines. So you know, there, there's this concept of almost effortfulness that I think inheres in these curved shapes. And that's kind of what I've been playing with in my mind the last few days when I've been thinking about this as to why I like that and, and sort of how that connotes, you know, luxury as it were. Uh, and maybe it connotes this idea of hands, like manual labor kind of thing, uh, you know, going on there as well, because, you know, you had to often do this by hand in an earlier era. So that's my, that's my sort of 
off the top of my head musing. And so I'm really curious to share that with you and see what you think. And if you see me looking off to the sides, because I've got a computer here, this is where I'm looking at the chat here. And uh, so I'm seeing what Martha is saying now too. Now, every curved label has a purpose and planning behind it, thoughtful. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's that's what that means to me. And I know that not everyone, you know, so so please, you know, share your thoughts alongside Martha's in the chat too, but while, while I wait to see if people want to type things, you know, the thing that I've also been thinking about is that not everyone does this style. Uh, and I think that's also partly an aesthetic preference. You know, I've talked to Tanya Buckingham in the UW Cartography Lab, and she is much more of a fan of straight labels. She thinks that I curve mine somewhat too often in situations where maybe she wouldn't, especially there's a lot of places where, you know, it's sort of 50-50 situations. You know, if I just have a, I'm just gonna make a quick document here. And if I've got some sort of, you know, roughly squarish shape, just gonna give a little bit of a little bit of a not perfect squarishness. And I'm just gonna hold Alt and drag over to make a copy of it of it. You know, I can see the uh, name of country. You know, a lot of people would say, let's let's do that. Maybe we'll we'll track that out a little bit. Using Myriad Pro here, sort of the default typeface. Uh, it's a pretty good typeface. I, uh, I know some people think we think we shouldn't use it because it's default, but you know things become classics and defaults because they're pretty good. You know, I would probably go name of country like this instead, in a shape like that, four or five times out of six, that kind of thing. And it's been a little while, kind of nudging that around and trying to get it exactly how I wanted. But I don't know. I just think that looks cooler. You know, what do you think? I mean, is this a is this a way of aesthetic expression? Not just. Uh, I mean, is I, I've wondered like if I show the same if I gave ten people the same map to play with and gave them the labeling hierarchy. I just wonder like how these ten different people would all apply those exact same labels. Oh, nope. I see. I see a message. Lost the feed. Okay, so don't want that happening. So what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna adjust. I'm gonna adjust my latency this with it with this experiment here. I think you know we can put up with six or seven seconds of latency. Okay. Um, it looks like. Okay, I gotta pause the stream for a second here. I gotta stop broadcasting for a moment, it looks like, to change the latency. So what I'll do is I'll wait, you know, there's there's one hiccup for Jim Lacey. If it happens again, then I'll stop the stream, recycle it, and and um, change the latency. But maybe it's just a single hiccup, hopefully. Because my stream health monitor says that I'm generally putting out a pretty decent bandwidth. You're seeing all this behind the scenes of what it takes to like do live stream. I've learned a lot through this process, certainly about how people try and look kind of professional. Um, yeah, well, Molly, that, I think it would be an interesting experiment. I've I've thought about this maybe even as the basis for a NASA's presentation. Like if I just sort of gave a bunch of people, ask them to to do this, and then sort of broke down some of the differences. I don't know. I've been thinking about like taking some of the stuff we talk about here and even turning it into a NASA's presentation. I feel like. I should have a better overarching narrative, but maybe that's not super critical because, you know, we're all map nerds and that's probably sufficient to keep people entertained. I mean, you're all here and I'm just just jamming out about type. Um, Martha's asking if I label based on feature type. Curve versus straight as an additional means of differentiation. And, and Rick's saying curve labels for natural features, straight for political. You know, I don't think as as actively about that, but I think that makes a lot of sense. And I was looking over this a little bit earlier, and you know, I think I've kind of almost in the back of my mind followed some of that. Uh, you know, I've got all of these towns here, we'll put back the background, all these various cities and towns, and they're all on straight labels. And I mean, they don't really, in many cases, fit the shape really well. That's often why we're I'm, I'm curving things oftentimes at least, you know, Langley here, the sort of the urbanized area at least that's built up, this is not really well fit to it. 
but it you know it kind of distinguishes it from the the natural features that are mostly curved and I do think there's sort of a flowing naturalness to curvature so maybe you know maybe you folks are thinking more organizedly as it were about that than I am but maybe it sort of is appealing to me in a way that I'm not even thinking about so that's that's interesting thanks for sharing that I like that uh, the other thing that kind of ties into what I've been saying up to this point. Um, actually, first, I got a question, too, is that I don't know if any of you have, you know, if we think about straight and curved as potentially meaning these different feature hierarchies or as aesthetic preferences and a way of expressing yourself almost on a map, uh, has anybody, like, had standards applied to them or that they applied to themselves? Like, if you worked at a place that says this is this is our style, this is what we do, or have you set something like that for yourself? I'd be really curious to know if that's sort of formalized in anybody's practice or has been in the past, or if you've heard about other people where that's that's the case. And, you know, when you think about that for a second, uh, I want to turn to one uh, sort of uh, other thing that's kind of related to this idea of curvature, too. Um, here's another map with more straight labels, but it's got a lot of curved city features. You know, this is that, uh, they call it National Geographic water bugs. Uh, those, you know, the National Geographic does a lot of these curved labels to just kind of dodge out of the way of things that, uh, especially on coastlines oftentimes, where we've got a really tightly packed in labels, but in this case it's a lot of them inland. You know, there's just no way to label Pleasant Ridge and Oak Park, etc. Uh, without them in straight lines, without them running into stuff. So I water bugged them. Uh, and I know they do that a lot theirs, and I think it's part of almost their their identity and style, which I've stolen for my own. Uh, but one of the things that I've also tried to think about is why this looks better than a straight angled label. Uh, there was a talk at Nasus 2018. Uh, I think it was by Brandon Plew. Uh, and he was talking about cartographic education, and uh, as yeah, it wasn't the, specifically the focus of his talk, but as sort of a, a, an aside during the talk, he was talking about the idea that you know something like like that, and like these Oak Park, Pleasant Ridge, Ferndale, etc., curve labels, seem to look better than if I just took you know one of these labels. I'm going to delete Hazel Park to get it out of the way, and took Harper Woods here and just angled it, right? that angle versus being on a curve. Something looks clunkier about this. And he was commenting that he wasn't quite sure why. And I'm not really quite sure why either. And it's kind of important to get at these aesthetic preferences, I think, when you're trying to teach them to people. That's one reason why I've been musing about this today and elsewise. And if I have a student who's doing something like this, I want to suggest to them, I don't think that looks as good, but it's not as satisfying to just hear that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily make as much sense. I feel like it's good to have something in there where you can say, and here's a good reason to think about why you should change that. Because, I don't know, maybe that they haven't really thought along those lines or tried the alternative, or maybe they really like it when it's at these angles, and even if perhaps a majority of readers potentially don't. So my, th my only thought, again, goes to this idea of kind of intent that, you know, it looks, it's simpler, it's more defaulty to just kind of turn things on its side and it seems more effortful and therefore kind of professional to curve things. So I'd be curious if, if any of you think that's sensible or if you have other thoughts about that or maybe you also don't care whether or not there's curves or straight lines. So, you know, be, be re really curious to hear about something like whether or not I'm, I'm on the right path with this kind of idea because I think it's important to get at why some of these things, especially in the the sort of fuzzy arts of typography, why these things seem to work for us. So what do you think? See, I'm looking over, to, I'm seeing if anybody has any comments and, you know, you're, and maybe, you know, maybe there's not much to say. I don't know. But I think that I think it's useful to think about. Maybe there's just something in our brains. I don't know. I'm not an expert in, you know, visual psychology, and there's probably people who study these kind of things. I mean, I've learned that, for example, you have special cells in your brain just for detecting edges, and you have different sets of, uh, 
edge detecting cells for different angles. So maybe there's, I don't know, maybe there's something about that with curves. So just a thought uh, about why that, why that might be. So those are my thoughts about curves on maps, and that's like 20 minutes then, which is, which is a lot more thoughts than I probably, probably expected I would have on something like that. Um, Molly thinks these labels are radical. Because they have a sheer horizontal tangent with the horizontal labels rather than the angled label option. Oh yeah, yeah, they they kind of, but they're kind of flowing together too. And I also think that another thing too related to that. Um, I kind of think like they're they're acting almost like an arrow, like swooping and pointing in toward that, you know, intentionally pointing toward that dot. Like you know, this label starts off straight and then it deliberately changes its course to connect with that dot. I think it brings your eye more to that dot with a little bit more intention versus Harper Woods. Well, I was already kind of going that way toward the dot anyway. Didn't have to take a detour. Again, that's just a thought, but I, I'm always sort of struggling sometimes for these good rules of thumbs and aesthetic things. Like, what do I tell the students? What's going to make sense to them that they're going to be able to secret that away in their minds and draw on that and feel confident that they're making a good decision? So it's fun to break down. Um, so yeah, that's my thoughts on curves. So uh, before I move on from this subject, I guess, you know, do you guys have any other thoughts, any other or questions or comments or talking about your own practice or you know if you got something that you've got on the internet, I can pull up and and we can look at as well if you wanna make some comments on it, pull up in the web browser, etc. Because this is right, we're all here together as a group. I don't. I'm not just recording this. I'm choosing to do these kind of things live for a reason. Because I like having you here. Because if I did this, you know, if I weren't doing this live, I could probably, you know, wait till I, my eyes weren't bleary and I could make sure that I cut out all the ums and hemming and hawing and, and inelegantly said things. And this would be much shorter. I could probably said all this in, in 15 minutes instead of 20 if I weren't rambling on. All right, well, we can always come back to this, too, if you get any thoughts. You know, as, as we're going on, if you think of something that's just type-related and it's not related to the specific thing that I'm saying, perfectly fine, and we can always cycle back to that whenever we want to. So I do have a question, though, uh, in general. One of the things uh, that I want to think about are typefaces. You know, I one of the things that I really love and that I think makes this a serene practice for me is I really like thinking about the aesthetics of individual typefaces, just appreciating their shapes. So I guess what I want to do is I want to ask you guys about some of your favorite go-to typefaces. I, you know, I did a survey about this um, some maybe a year, year and a half ago. I asked people, you know, what their preferred typefaces were. Um, if I go to my blog, you should probably hear somewhere. Um, Typefaces. Cartographers prefer typefaces. It was a real simple informal survey, and some people had some thoughts about some various sans and serifs that they really liked um, that came up a few times in, in the voting. And, you know, several people mentioned, of course, oftentimes what do you choose for your map is going to be very dependent on what makes sense for the aesthetics that you want to convey. But many of us have ones that we kind of like to default to or we hope we get a chance to use. So so I'd be curious to know if any of you have ones that you really like to think about or really like to use. And while you think about that, uh, I'm going to talk about one of my favorites, which is Adobe Caslon by Carol Twombly. You know, there, as I men mentioned here, there's a lot of versions of Caslon. Caslon is an old typeface. You know, it goes back, I don't know, a couple hundred years. You know, check Wikipedia on that. Oh, there's a link right there. So, yeah, 1692 to 1766 was when William Caslon lived. And there's been a lot of sort of revivals of it and people copying it in books and kind of making adjustments. Uh, and I really like it because it has uh, a large family. Yeah, just like Martha saying, she prefers typefaces with large families. You know, that's one reason I really like Caslon is that it's got a lot of flexibility. Because we're trying to make... Um, we're trying to make... Uh, uh, oftentimes a lot of different hierarchical distinctions in our maps. So I've got, you know, got some islands here, and I've got some some uh, cities here, and I've got some water features, and I want to make them all look different, but I want to hang have them hang together. 
as it were. So I think that you know, getting a typeface that has a lot of options really helps. So Adobe Caslon's got, you know, it's got uh, semi-bold as well as bold. So you got a couple of weights here, which is nice. You can use that to make some distinctions. And it's got a nice italic. And that italic comes with swash capitals, which I really love in the italics. If I uh, go to my open type features and just turn those off for a second, you can see the Strait of Georgia label. Look at the S and the G in there. And they get much more boring. And this that's sort of nice old style, you know, very fancy capital italics. I can turn those on and off by default. Uh, I've got those going on also in this uh, in this Michigan map as well. They're a little bit, um, they're not quite as fancy, but just these little extra dangly pieces on the W and the B in Whitefish Bay, for example, uh, really uh, just you know really add sort of a little bit more elegance to it. So I love that and. I also like the fact that it has a proper small cap set. If I zoom in here, you can see Bellingham, Ferndale, all my towns and cities, they're in small caps. And uh, one thing I didn't really realize for a long time in working with small caps is the importance of a proper set of small caps versus a fake set. Uh, and some of my earlier maps definitely have fake small caps. If I go here and I turn on turn on small caps, and you can see that that N is thicker than that, and then that A, and also the spacing is not really great between them, the kerning, uh, because all it did was take a capital A, M, and E and shrink them down, so that means they also got thinner. Uh, versus, you know, if I turn this into Adobe Caslon here, the weights are the same between the strokes in the N and the A, or in the C and the O, because there's actually separate glyphs designed in the typeface to make that work. Uh, and certainly some of my projects don't, you know, they, they use fake small caps. I can think of, for example, I've got uh, my various river maps that I produced uh, some years ago. I made these maps of rivers in a so transit map style, and I've actually, they're not online, but I've actually done a lot of work to, to adjust some of the typography in these things. And you can see though, you know, the, let's see, we'll pull up the PDF here. Yeah, you can see those, those capitals are thicker uh, for these different river names. So it's not ideal. I've made some changes to a lot of the ones that I've got in my local files, because eventually, someday, if I get around to it, I will finally compile these into a book. But uh, the online versions are still not not updated yet. I haven't gotten around to that. So yeah, I, I, I really like working with Adobe Caslon Pro for you know that flexibility that it offers, so that I can get all of this map done in one typeface, even though all these different things kind of look different and, and carry all these different meanings. Uh, Sabon, uh, I've not uh, I don't know if I've heard about that. So Molly and Martha really like Sabon. So let's I'm gonna have a look here. An Old Style Serif by Jan Chisholt. I don't know how to say that. That's okay. Oh, I really like that. I like I like old styles. Um, they sort of typefaces that, you know, they, well, they're old style. They're like sort of from the early days of typography when typography was really trying to mimic uh, hand-lettered manuscripts, you know, black letter style. Like if you look at you know stuff like this, you know, this this kind of stuff eventually turned into this kind of stuff uh, over time. And of course, there are typefaces that look like those old medieval black letter manuscripts as well. Uh, one of the things that I've I've learned is really helpful in thinking about type is to use Wikipedia and other internet resources. You know. I can stare at a typeface and think, well, why do I like it, or what are its characteristics or properties? But it turns out lots of experts have already thought about this stuff already, and so there, you know, different, you know, there are, are different classification systems for type, for example. So if I want to start to get a a sense of what might be a good situation to use a typeface, well, I can start to look at, for example, its history, right? So, you know, the design of the Roman 
set of these typefaces is based on Claude Garriman's work in the you know 16th century. So this is probably going to look old, even if I don't realize offhand at first that's what's happening in my mind when I read a map. Now I can now I have that knowledge, and I can start to use that intentionally when I'm working. You know, I didn't realize for a long time that I really like Art Deco, and I really like sort of the interwar period of design. But I realized I was really drawn to, you know, typefaces that looked like this. Uh, and then I started looking at these typefaces and looking them up on the internet. Uh, things like Futura or Avenir. Uh, got them in the blog post, too, I think. Um, uh, I don't know where I put yeah. Well, we'll look for it again. So I get quick examples of those, you know. Avenir, Century Gothic, these are, right, these are uh, what we call geometric sans serifs. They're very geometrically structured. So the, the O, pretty much perfect circle. And the E, a circle with some pieces adjusted kind of thing. Straight lines, simple basic curves. And that's characteristic of a certain time period. So now I can use that intentionally. I can say I want things to look like they're from that period of the past. And of course, you know, you don't have to use it with historical pastiches, but it's just really, you know, it's been really useful to me to just ask the internet, ask experts to tell me more about the background of this typeface. I don't have to figure it out myself. It's hard for me oftentimes to develop intelligent sounding opinions about type and about a lot of other aesthetic things. You know, it's it's a muscle you kind of got to exercise in your brain. And one of the things to do is to sort of piggyback on other people's work and just read up on Caslon and Sabon and all these kind of things. But that is a lovely typeface, definitely. Um, I used to use sort of my first, my first phase of typography in my career. I liked using a, another old style that you know, just sort of your Windows default. Uh, one of the Windows typefaces uh, was uh, Hightower, uh, which I probably, yeah, Hightower text here. And it doesn't have a small cap set, I can see, so we'll turn that off. Right. Uh, that looks, you know, this makes this map look a lot older, I think, by doing something like that. Also, that was where I learned about the importance of, again, versatility. To go back to what I was talking with Caslon and what Martha was saying with the large type family. Hightower text not, does not have a lot. It's kind of regular, you know, also called Roman, and you know, it's got an italic. It doesn't have bold, so I would get into mapping situations where I realized I didn't have a lot of options. So I stopped using it so much over time, even though it's, it's pretty nice. So yeah, I don't know, does anybody else have other typefaces that they really like to Really like to work with, or you know, that tend to come up a lot because I'd love to hear about one of them. Because honestly, you know, you learn about some of these good things by just sharing back and forth and seeing what people tweet about or talk about in situations like these or at conferences. Well, if you come up with something too, definitely just we can come back to that too. Put that in the chat. Um, yeah, so this is, this is kind of, they're kind of my favorites, and, you know, I really like using Catalan. Also, I like using Avenir for my Serif. It's kind of overused, probably, nowadays. Uh, you know, the, we used, I, I got into it with the Atlas of Design when we were editing that, but, um, you know, it's got a lot of different weights. Five, one, two, three, four, five, six, six weights. Um, and you know, it comes in obliques, which uh, does bring to mind another thing. Something it took me a long time to realize. Uh, obliques don't make as much of an impact as I used to think they did. Uh, you know, an italic type looks pretty different than a Roman type, right? So you have Portage Island, Bellingham Bay. Those those characters look very different from each other, but. If I just take this here and put it, you know, set it book here, book weight, Roman, those two, you know, this looks a little bit different, but if they're on the other side of the map from each other and this is at an angle, it's a lot harder to tell that this is any different than this one versus Bellingham Bay versus Portage. You know, 
I don't really I don't really use obliques that much anymore. If I really want to make a hierarchical distinction, I'd rather use a serif typeface that has a has an italic where the characters actually just drawn differently. I mean, you know, here we've got a single story A in Bellingham. You know, it's an A that's just a circle with a little line on it versus the what they call the two story A, where it's you know kind of like two little circles kind of thing in Portage Island here. And that makes a pretty strong distinction. So. You know, it's one of those things where I was probably getting caught up in the technical distinction that I knew about and not thinking about the fact that even though I made it different, my readers probably weren't able to key in on that difference very much. You know, if I'm labeling, you know, rivers, for example, you know, along all those shapes and curves, yes, they might be in italic or, you know, what's sometimes called obliques because there's kind of a difference between italics and obliques. Uh, and some of their parts were set regular or Roman, as they call it. You know, that's that's not a big difference that probably readers are really keying in on. So, you know, it's something to think about. Be be kind of my advice to you about that in using serif typefaces, uh, or rather, sans serif typefaces. Sorry. So yeah, that's kind of. That's kind of my go-to piece of advice, is advice nowadays on those kind of things. A lot of what I'm also doing is I'm kind of secretly drawing out of the back of my mind from the Practicardo series that I did a couple years ago when I was just tweeting out various things about, um, you know, whatever I could fit in 140 characters uh, uh, on mapping, and a lot of that sort of ended up focusing on typography, as I recall. I had a few short pieces of advice there. Um, Question: What typeface? What typeface are my water bodies? Um, so these are all right now. Then these Ferndale labels that I quick changed. Everything on this map is in Adobe Caslon, and so you know they it looks kind of different, but it still looks like it belongs together. Uh, that's the nice thing about using everything from the same type family. Is those italics were designed to go with those Romans, uh, with those regular labels, and you know getting a versatile typeface typeface family is really important. I think for having that option. And I know that, you know, some people like to do the whole uh, sort of natural features in, um, in serif and sans serif for constructed features or artificial or countries and administrative features kind of thing. Uh, I'm, I'm more of a one typeface kind of person. You know, sometimes I'll mix and match a little bit. I've definitely done that in projects. Um, but I don't always even do it in that sort of natural, artificial way. Sometimes there are other distinctions I want to make. So uh, the project I worked on a couple years ago, I made a lot of maps for the Ecological Atlas, the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. And we, we broke down part of one of these maps in a previous stream. And uh, this, is, this is kind of a small example. I'll, we'll zoom in on one of the other ones in a minute. But I actually mostly had the base map in serif, and all the thematic data were in sans. And there had two brand typefaces that the client Audubon Alaska you know, was using for these, so I already had sort of go-to ones that their branding people had decided that already kind of go well together. Uh, but you know, even if you look at something like this here, you know, all of all of these labels for the all the water features, all the background information, you know, peninsula and such, it's all in um, Grand Gen, which is their serif type. And then all the thematic data are in sans, uh, gill sans, in this case, was the one they used, which is another pretty versatile one that's that's a nice classic. So I think that makes a distinction, too. You know, I'm more about, if I'm going to use two typefaces, making a distinction between two really strongly different classes of things in my maps. And maybe that's physical and you know versus cities and, and administrative units. But in this case, it was mostly about the, uh, the thematic versus the background kind of stuff most of the time. So yeah. Uh, I, you know, looking at these labels, uh, one of the things I, I did, um, one of the things that I, I did here a lot was I used, uh, you can probably see that here in more detail, I did a lot of knockouts, and I think I talked about this in my last stream. I you know, tend to try and get my a lot of my background stuff out of the way of my labels, but also one thing that I've started to do a little bit more lately that I haven't blogged about or said said too much about because I'm still getting the hang of it, uh, is to do some blurring in the background instead. This is an idea that comes from uh, Joshua Stevens, I want to say. I believe it was him who tweeted about uh, this technique where you know, we're often 
knocking things out or adding halos to our maps. And sometimes there's an alternative way. So if I go back to this thing and I turn back on, acting a little slowly here, turn back on my background. I've got, there we go, you know, I've got these halos around a lot of my labels to help them survive against all the complexity of the background. But it's possible instead what I could have done is blurred the background rather than lightened it. Uh, and that's what I've got going on in this map. So I've got a client I've been working with um, and I asked him before that these are these are some maps that that I can share um, about he's, he's mapping a particular site uh, 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 Imperial Palace and Garden and Temple Complex in China. And I love these names. Like, these are real places. The Temple of the Dragon King. Pear Blossoms Accompanied by the Moon. So uh, beautifully poetic. But if you, you zoom in on the type here in the back versus the background raster that I have, I'm not really lightening the raster. I'm blurring it instead. There's no halo. There's no, like, white around this kind of thing. Because if you think about it, you know, this raster doesn't get very dark ever. But it does have a lot of sort of thin bands to it. These are these um, illuminated or, or Tanaka contours, which I had to do because uh, the D this is a very large scale map, and the DEM we had was just very coarse. It didn't look very good. It was mushy and blurry and full of artifacts when we did uh, shaded relief of it. So I decided to do this instead to give a little bit of depth to the area. And that's maybe a you know, side note we can talk about in some sort of future stream. But um, if I go, to, I'm going to go back to Photoshop here for a minute, and I'm going to look at just the background layer that I've got right I'm going to turn off the, the blurring here. You can see turn on and off. You see a difference that it makes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn off, save this, and go back to Illustrator and says, well, we've updated my raster. Would you like to update the preview? I say yes. And it's that gets a little noisier. It actually does make a difference, and maybe more with our light gray labels. The Pine Forest Valley. And these are probably fine without it, but I just like to add that little extra distinction. Um, the thing is that you know, we often think about labels versus the background in terms of just the colors. Is there enough color contrast? But it's what really often makes it a challenge is that it's sort of small, sharp edges behind our labels. So, you know, if I've got this label here and I'll make it like 70%, and I'm just going to put behind it, you know, some lines. I'm going to give them, give them all a stroke in a minute. I'm just going to switch over to outline mode and pick those back up. Let's give them a stroke, and we'll say, I don't know, 40, eh, 30%. And we'll move those behind in this other layer. Right, doesn't look great. Also thicken them just a little bit. Yeah, there we go. You know, you can read against that, but it's not a great experience, certainly. And yet, if you take that same level of contrast of, you know, this is 30% black, this label is 70% black, and instead I'm just going to copy this label over here. You know, if I put just a 30% black behind, then it's fine. So oftentimes what's really interfering with legibility is not just color contrast issues, it's just constant sharp changes behind things. And so we don't really need a halo per se. We don't need to lighten the background. The background is not too dark. Uh, instead, the background just needs to be, those edges need to be softened. And so that's what I'm doing here. I'm just going you know, to turn that Gaussian blur back on and just soften that up. And we save that and go back, update my links, go back to here, and there we go. And that you know, and that works. And it's maybe not as obvious of a thing. You know, it it's got its downsides as a method. It's not like every time I move one of these labels, it's got to be I got to go actually back and copy this back to Illustrator or to to Photoshop. I got to re-output the label layer and use it as a mask. You know, right now I've just got uh, a mask with all my labels. Um, and I've just got them offset just a little bit and uh, then feathered in so it's kind of softened. And I've just used that as a, 
as a mask on my filter so it only blurs the vicinity, softly blurs the vicinity around labels. So I gotta kind of be satisfied with these labels being where I want them to be. So that's usually like my last step. But I think it's I think it's pretty useful. Uh, so I, I definitely encourage you to try that out. And again, that's you know not something I came up with by any means, and I'm pretty sure it was Joshua Stevens that uh, tweeted that out to me. I should have looked that up before I before I mentioned it. But uh, it's a pretty good idea, you know. And he's often working. He's working at at NASA, and he's working with a lot of imagery data. Where again, it's, it's kind of noisy. Like maybe there's maybe you've lightened your background enough. Maybe you know the the actual colors of the land cover or whatever are fine, but, you know, pixel-based data about land cover or CO2 or whatever can be very noisy, and so just softening that can make a huge difference. Uh, Molly's asking if I keep type style sheets for a project with many maps as Audubon, and tips on keeping them streamlined so I don't need to finish, finish finished maps. Yeah, that's, so I did, I made 130 maps or so, for the ecological atlas of the Bering, Chukchi, and Beaufort Seas. It was, you know, it was a big undertaking. You know, that's, you can kind of see the edge of the book here, how thick it is. Um, I don't think I have any other shots of the physical object, which, by the way, free online. You ever want to look at this project, um, you go to my portfolio, somethingaboutmaps.com, click the portfolio button, you can find this thing, and then there's a link right there. Or you can just Google the book title. Everything's available for download. Um, and it's at kind of a medium resolution, like 150 dpi. And if you ever want to email me and ask for an Illustrator file of some of the original, because you want to kind of break down how it was put together, just just send me an email or send me a Twitter message or something like that. I can share those with you uh, if you want to kind of go into the the depths of how any individual spread <coughs> spread was created. I did have a style sheet for uh, loosely, we'll say. So, yeah, if I go to my um, project files for that, uh, I've got templates, you know, and I broke down one of the templates um, already. So a lot of the base map stuff that was, you know, that was already sort of burned in there. And I, I changed the link to where the background raster is. I'm not going not gonna to look for that now. But, you know, all of the, all of the type on this map, you know, I had, I had set styles that I was consistently reusing because I was reusing those maps. Uh, as far as everything else, I did try for the very first time in my career, I think, put together a spec sheet. I'm much more of a, I'm going to store stuff in the back of my head kind of person because I'm usually working on two or three maps in the series at the most. This was definitely a size that I've never taken on before. Uh, but I did have a page on typography for this kind of stuff. And, you know, the base map type had its own section, even though I wasn't ever having to really recreate that. I was just using templates most of the time. Um, we never ended up doing annotations, but we, we thought we might. And I, you know, I set some of this stuff up. I usually recreated it from memory most of the time. Um, and I see Bartha is getting anxiety about storing. Yeah, I do. I... I have a terrible memory for a lot of things. Like, you know, I don't remember, like, like, I'm looking down, I know what I'm wearing right now, but if I couldn't see, I wouldn't even remember what clothes I put on this morning. Uh, I couldn't recollect that. But yet, for a lot of cartographic stuff, I kind of remember a lot of, a lot of these details um, when I'm going back and forth. And there's also a lot of copy pasting from other maps. Like, I remember, oh, I did such and such in a previous, map in the series or in a previous project, I'm just copy that right over. Uh, I did, though, try and be more organized with this. And also, my I've got styles built into these sheets, too. So, you know, I, I tried to really be good about storing a lot of stuff, and I may have mentioned this, too, about, um, you know, I had swatch panels here already ready to go. Uh, but if I go to uh, type uh, paragraph styles, I have a lot of this stuff stored just to be ready, so I didn't have to think too hard about it. You know, so I can drop a new line on there and say, well, let's, you know, um, you know I want to sort of start labeling this, and I want to label that in the activity style or a stock or subpopulation. And part of the the challenge with this is because we were working with so many different kinds of data, and 
it, it was hard to sort of prepare in advance to know what kind of thing we were going to map and to say, well, this is where now we need to map this particular subpopulation of polar bears. Well, I didn't develop a type style for a subpopulation. Should I, you know, how, should I lump that in with some of my, with the activity style or should I make a new style? So some of this was developed, uh, you know, along the way and then I had to go back and change it. And I think I might have mentioned too, like sometimes there, uh, well, I did mention one change that I made, like, I think in my, my live stream breaking this down, I, uh, Barrow renamed itself to Ukiavik, which is not how you say it at all. And so, so I had to go back and change like 30 maps that I'd made thus far. That's not a style sheet problem, but I did do things like later on, you know, I made 20 or 30 maps and I decided, you know, I don't like the curvature of long straight. Let's change that. And then I would go through and copy paste and redo all those because I get really obsessive. You know, I just talked for 20 minutes about curves earlier. And I get very obsessed about finding exactly the right curvature. And I'm, you know, I'll, I'll do it and then I'll go back 10 minutes later and say, no, I'm going to go back to that one. A week later, no, I want to go back to that one. I want to keep going back and kind of obsess about what feels right. And, you know, there's no no rules or guidelines, especially these water features. Where's the straight? I don't know. Where, there's not like a boundary to where the straight is. But it, I tend to, I tend to really dig into that, which um, brings me to. I should I want to show you. This is just more of an indulgence than maybe a specific educational moment. But this label here, the Beaver Archipelago, is probably. I remember this. Like this is the greatest label I've ever placed in my life. I was so happy. And I finally got it in just the right spot. And that was, I don't know, on and off, probably 45 minutes to an hour of obsessing when I was, you know, I, not all at once. I just I'd go label something else to come back to and say, I'm still not satisfied with it. It was a real challenge uh, because I was like, how do I, how do I collect all these islands together? You know, I could have, just to give an example about like, I could have kind of gone like, this, I need to brush that in black so you can kind of see just, you know, I could have maybe like that, but then that's too far from the Fox Islands, you know, and I start to run into the Manitou Passage, same thing, you know, but then if I do it up here, I didn't seem sweeping and curved enough in either case. So I don't remember the specifics of what I was thinking at the time. I'd have to sort of game up the scenarios again, but yeah, that's like... I'm, I'm such a cartography nerd, I have like a favorite label of my career kind of thing. I'm very pleased with that one. And I see also in the comments, yes, styles or digital... Okay, so I, maybe, yeah, maybe I'm more organized than I think. I use styles sometimes, but really, you know, it's mostly in the projects I do for like Audubon Alaska, that's, you know, they, they we've kind of got something set up. And, you know, I have other clients too that I'm making maps for that are remarkably similar. Like a lot of people ask me, you know, make one or two maps for my book, you know, a book about history or what have you and simple grayscale maps. And I tend to make those look pretty well the same. Uh, I have a style that I like to use, even the, you know, as long as they don't have specific requirements. And maybe I should like actually document that instead of recreating it from scratch every time. I mean, I guess Martha's probably cringing again at that thought, um, but... This is this is your your encouragement is helpful in that regard. Maybe I will start to go back and see the way that I've done some of these things and just write it down, or just make a, a Illustrator file that I can build from in the future. Because yeah, I'm really a make it up as you go kind of person, and then I just kind of offhand remember, oh, I did that before. Eh, let's try it again, kind of thing. So I could probably be a little bit more efficient. Um, one other quick thing I want to mention while I'm, while I'm looking at this before we go on to this, uh, go on to wrapping up. Uh, I really, really wish Illustrator had uh, multi line curved labels, and perhaps some of you are also annoyed by that. There's uh, Magic Minsky Bay here, or I don't know how you actually pronounce that. I'm just going to see if I have other ones going on here. And, you know, I try and avoid doing them where possible just because it's a pain, but I've definitely definitely done this in multiple instances on maps. Uh, getting these things to match the curves um, can be really tough. If you get a simple curve like like this one, you know, if it's pretty shallow, 
then I could probably just copy paste the next line down and that looks pretty good but sometimes when you have a steeper curve it doesn't look as good uh, let me go back to the bureau there so I tend to and it's kind of painstaking but I tend to do offset paths instead so I'll draw the shape that I want say I want it to look like this and then I'll say let's path offset this thing you know I don't know 30 points or whatever size that I need to work with and now I have just delete the excess bits here now I have two lines that are spaced a certain distance apart and they exactly match each other and that can be especially if you've got like type with more of an S curve you know I can't really as easily get that to perfectly match up so an offset is better and I really don't understand why Illustrator can't just come up with you know putting multi-line curve type together that would be great uh, you know the downside of course doing this offset path and doing any kind of multi-line is that if I decide to change this later I've got to change this one uh, the other thing I've done sometimes is I actually type and then I copy this and then I paste and then I change the baseline shift oh, I meant to paste in place sorry paste in place change the baseline shift so now they're still in the same common baseline at least and still two objects but then you got to change usually the tracking to match because sometimes as you hit the sharp point of a curve the tracking starts to get wider or narrower and if I put that there versus that there you got to manually adjust that uh, Martha saying comes from a background yeah working in a shop the number of people that's yeah I've, I've only ever worked worked on my own so uh, it's I can kind of just do what I want I don't have to match with anybody else and definitely I imagine if I worked at a small shop or a big shop that these are the kind of things that probably would have been drilled into me much sooner but mostly just on my own with these kind of things and sometimes there's brand guidelines I've got a hue to for a client but other than that it's kind of the only thing that I've got to stick with so yeah that's you know we're coming up on on one hour so I think it's a good kind of pausing point for for closing thoughts so as always you know thanks so much for joining me I really appreciate that you take the time to to do this this is the last in the current sort of series that I promised and a few months ago I said you know I, I did one of these as an experiment and I said well you know let's do three more let's give this a, a full real try uh, and so that's at a close I'm not saying that I'm not going to do this anymore by any means um, it's been a good experience and there seem to be you know more than two people watching and I when I first started doing this I was like how many people am I really gonna get who's gonna actually watch me just sit around musing about typography especially in a day like today when I'm not really showing you as many practical things so I don't know how that whether this is potentially less interesting to you uh, and that's fine if that is we can kind of adjust the format but you know I've been pleasantly surprised to get two-digit numbers of people and we 22 people it says are watching right now which is a lot more people than I would expect to spend part of their day listening to me talk about why I think curved labels are cool kind of thing so yeah I appreciate that and I will probably do more of these uh, I just it, maybe it'll continue on the first Wednesday of the month um, maybe not I need to think a little bit about timing and some other things I've got going on but if you want to follow me on Twitter you know you can always go back to somethingaboutmaps.com and link to my Twitter right there uh, I will announce that kind of stuff there uh, and then uh, as well you also get notified uh, if you uh, follow me on Patreon like you don't even have to be a subscriber, uh, but of course, if you want to throw some support my way, get the shameless plug kind of thing, your support helps me do stuff like this. And so, you know, along those lines too, you know, uh, I very much appreciate the support that people have been showing me and it helps me do stuff like this. It also helps me do other things like recently I took ads off my blog, which has been great. And, and the support that people have given me has made that possible because uh, I use free WordPress dot com hosting and they put ads on my blog and it gets in the way it looks kind of annoying and it costs me money to make them go away so I've been able to afford WordPress's fees thanks to that kind of thing so I really appreciate that and of course you know besides any sort of financial support just your time because 
you know, that's encouraging. If I were doing this and three people were here, uh, I mean, those three people might be cool and interactive and I like them, but, uh, you know, I don't get as, you, know, you get to sort of feed off the energy of the crowd, as it were. So, yeah, I think uh, that's sort of my closing thoughts. Uh, and it's one o'clock central time right now. So until next time, uh, yeah, I'll let you go. Thanks for taking time. Bye-bye.